is the Tom Hartman Program. And greetings, my friends, patriots, lovers of democracy, truth and justice, believers in peace, freedom, and the American way. Tom Hartman here with you. And I am so pleased. It is it is Friday. Normally we do anything goes Friday. We're not going to do that in our first hour. We're going to do, uh, or the first 50 minutes of our first hour, we're going to do uh, ask a meteorologist, not a meteorologist, a climate scientist. Right. Michael Mann is with us and and uh, pr a distinguished professor of meteorology, director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University, uh, the author of Dire Predictions, Understanding Climate Change, which is just now out in second edition and has a new book coming out with Tom Tolles, the, the brilliant uh, cartoonist uh, that you can pre-order at uh, the, in, you know, the usual suspect sources, uh, Amazon and whatnot, called The Madhouse Effect. Uh, his website is Michael Mann, with two N's, just like my name, uh, michaelmann.net, and you can uh, tweet him at Michael E. Mann, M-A-N-N. -N. So, Dr. Mann, welcome. Uh, it's great to literally be with you, yeah, uh, Tom. Yeah, yes. physically in yes, the studio. It's, it's so nice. And, and, and what we'll do, just uh, for those of you who are watching and might have a question for Dr. Mann, is uh, we're going to talk for five or six minutes about, you know, just what's going on in the world and this kind of thing. And then we will open the phone lines up to your calls, you know, assuming that any of you have questions for us. Um, Chris is standing by to, to answer the phones and I hear them ringing already. So, so Dr. Mann, what is the current state of the art of knowledge about, I mean, for example, I've been seeing this spiral graphic that's gone kind of viral and it's sure the heck, heck looks to me like We've gone from a linear transition, you know, one, two, three, four, five, to something that's approaching a log transition, you know, 10, 100, 1,000, or, or whatever, you know. In biology, they call it amplification. Um, are we at that? Are we there? Are we moving there? Because that's the point of not necessarily no return. That might be an exaggeration, but... Well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, no, the, the, I, you're referring to the, the viral spiral, yeah. as I call it. Exactly. Um, it's just a, a wonderful graphic uh, that a colleague of mine from the UK, Ed Hawkins, um, uh, who's not a professional graphic artist, uh, he's a climate scientist, but he, he came up with this uh, particular way of um, illustrating um, the changes in global temperature over the past uh, century. And uh, it was very engaging. Um, I, I think it was a new way of looking at a data set that many people have seen a million times, the global temperature graph. Sometimes when you look at the same data, but you look at it in a different way, um, and this is true as a scientist, it makes you think about it differently. And so it was a very effective way of showing, you know, as the temperatures spiral out over time, how quickly, how close we are to this two degree Celsius, three and a half degree, Fahrenheit uh, boundary. Uh, danger point. What many scientists have concluded uh, constitutes dangerous and potentially irreversible climate change. In fact, we are so close to that boundary that we are beginning to exceed it on the monthly time scale, which is to say if we hmm. see a very warm month like we've seen this year, we've seen some very warm months uh, globally, uh, in particular uh, because of the El Nino, a very large El Nino on top of global warming. And so temperatures have started to exceed that boundary. They're not permanently outside it. The spiral hasn't permanently gone outside that two degree circle, but it's getting perilously and, close. And, that, and that's worldwide. If we look at the Arctic, it's a whole different story. It's a far worse story. That's right. And in fact, if you were to look at uh, a spiral uh, for temperatures in the Arctic, what you would see is that temperatures are spiraling outward across, across those boundaries, across the two degree boundary, even faster because of the amplifying effect of melting ice, melting snow. So you get even more heating of right. the Arctic Ocean, you get more warming. Uh, it's what we call a positive feedback, but it's not a good thing, it's a bad thing. Right. It's a vicious cycle. One of the things I did uh, on, my, uh, on the TV show last night as, as my op-ed at the end of the day, um, you know, we talked about the, the, the flooding of the Seine in France, the river, the the uh, Paris is underwater. They're, they've closed the Louvre because they're they're having to protect they're moving the, the, the arc. Up, yeah, upstairs yeah, everything, now. Every, yeah. everything that's uh, you know, yeah, and and people are dying there. People are dying here. We have these floods in Texas. Um, the atmosphere right now has somewhat somewhere in, the, in excess. My understanding is of about five percent more water than it did in let's say the year I was born, 1951. That's right. And um, and given that, um, 
if it holds more water vapor, when it rains, more water comes out of the sky. And so these mega storms, these, you know, these horrible, you know, Texas and France getting, you know, three weeks worth of rain in, in one or two days um, is an absolutely predictable result. And my rant was the media in the United States is committing near criminal malpractice by not associating or even mentioning climate change in the context of these wild weather events. And I'm convinced that they don't want to offend their advertisers, uh, whether it's Coke Industries or whether it's ExxonMobil or whatever. Um, uh, or, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, I got a half a dozen conspiracy theories yeah. on that. It might just be plain old stupidity. What are your thoughts on this? There's a lot to chew on there. Uh, and and uh, yeah, we, we were mentioning the Louvre, of course, the, the paintings, the famous paintings, so they're moving those upstairs right now. And what they're seeing in Paris, what we saw earlier, um, just last month in Texas, we are seeing uh, a remarkable increase in the frequency of these very intense rainfall events, these very intense uh, flooding events. In fact, the blizzard that we saw, the historic blizzard in Washington, D.C. earlier this winter, um, that blizzard, there was so much snow because ocean temperatures were as warm as they were. Uh, you sometimes hear from the critics, you know, people like James Inhofe, who will introduce a snowball on the Senate floor as uh, a putative disproof of global warming. Uh, not only is it silly, uh, the opposite of, uh, of that is likely the case, which is to say that uh, we expect bigger snowfall events in the middle of the winter as temperatures get, uh, you know, as temperatures warm, as ocean temperatures warm up. Um, and that's what we're seeing, yeah. whether it's blizzards on the east coast of the U.S., uh, flooding events in Texas or in Paris. And as you said, it's not that complicated. The underlying physics uh, is pretty basic. Uh, for each degree Fahrenheit warming uh, of uh, the globe, we expect a roughly 3% increase in the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. It's a fundamental physical so each, relationship. Each degree Celsius? Each degree Celsius, uh, more like 5%. Uh, five so you're talking yeah. Fahrenheit. So, yeah. so, so we're at 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit right now, so that's in the neighborhood of 4 or 5%. In right? the neighborhood of 4 or 5% more moisture in the atmosphere already. And, and that means you can get, when it does rain, it literally is more likely to pour. Uh, right. You're more likely to see floods. You're more likely to see blizzards along the east coast of the U.S., where those very warm ocean temperatures uh, come into contact with cold air. Um, you get these uh, massive blizzards as well. Right. We have uh, about a minute and a half here before we hit a break, and we're going to start taking some phone calls. Um, at what point do you feel that we have we have hit something that resembles a point of no return? Well, the sad truth is we've probably already hit certain points of no return. We're, we're probably already committed to the melting of a large amount of the West Antarctic ice sheet, enough to give us eventually 10 to 14 feet of sea level rise. Uh, if we're lucky, that happens uh, very slowly over many centuries. Uh, there are other tipping points that lie out there. They're like uh, mines in a minefield. And uh, the problem is the farther we go out into that minefield, uh, the more we warm the planet, the more likely we are to encounter those. Right. Any sense of how far away we might be from a, uh, uh, you know, I ran up a methane, you know, <laughs> about, about a, a methane tipping point, whether it's permafrost or Arctic, uh, the six trillion tons of, or a billion or whatever it is of it. Yeah, well, we know it happened in the past when the Earth was roughly as warm as we're making it now. Um, right. So that is one of those tipping points that, that uh, almost certainly lies out there. And just how close we are to it, we're not sure. The only safe strategy, of course, is to not walk out into the minefield. Right. We need to stop using fossil fuels. Just that's, and, it, and uh, you know, several countries now, Germany and uh, I think it was uh, Finland or Denmark, um, hit a uh, Virtually 100% renewable energy a couple times this year. The UK, the UK. Um, just a couple weeks ago, uh, burned no coal for several days in yeah. a row. For the first time since the 19th century. That's right. It's amazing. Dr. Michael Mann is with us. We'll be back with your calls for Dr. Mann right after this. To watch more clips from our programs, hit the Watch More Videos button over here. And please be sure to hit the handy-dandy subscribe button so you'll always be up to date. Tag, you're it.